Hi everybody, I am Catherine Merry, Olympic 400 meter bronze medalist back in Sydney 2000 in that race behind Kathy Freeman and also I was previously the fastest woman in the world over 400 metres and now very happily work in broadcasting and hosting events around the world in a variety of sports but of course in particular athletics. So I have questions so shall I start with the first question so my first question was what was the toughest session you used to run when you were training for 400 metres? Gosh, that's, um, that's a really good question and, and one that's quite hard to answer because I've erased most of the training sessions that I did because they were a little bit brutal. And under the guidance of Olympic 100 metre champion, Linford Christie and coach Ron Rodden, they used to set some very interesting sessions. But I think a lot of people are surprised when I say we didn't used to run very far on the track. Um, I never ran over 500 metres on any given track session in any given time of the year, so summer or winter. So it was a real mixture of speed and speed endurance. But the worst track session and the toughest track session, I'd say, was probably when we'd start at 500 metres and we'd go down in 100 metre increments and go 500, 400, 300, 200, 100 and then go back up 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Um, we just get a decent amount of recovery in between. I think Linford used to give us between about 12, 12 and 13 minutes between each run and not flat out, not mad, but trust me, psychologically, it was as hard as anything. Cause once you'd gone back down and you knew you had to go back up, then that wasn't very nice at all. So that I think would probably be my toughest, the toughest session um, that we used to do on the track. Okay, next question. What and who was the biggest influence on your career and why? Oh, gosh. Um, I think everybody takes influence from people at different times in their lives and different places where they're at, whether that's age based or part of your career base. So for me, the biggest influence when I started athletics, my parents were a huge influence on my dad was a English school's triple jump medalist in the 1950s. And he was still competing in veteran athletics or masters, as it was called then. So he was a big influence on me because he was still at this point, not triple jumping anymore. His knees couldn't take that, but he was still sprinting. So getting into athletics via a PE teacher called Gwilym Price, who lived two doors down from me in Dunchurch near rugby. Uh, Gwilym Price was a massive influence on my career because he said I look quick and I could be quite good and that was somebody outside of my parents telling me so I listened to him more um, so he was a massive influence on me Gwilym Price I still stay in touch with him now um, and in terms of role models outside of uh, Gwilym and outside of my parents it would have to be the pictures on the wall I had of Kathy Cook um, everybody knows I'm a massive Kathy Cook fan. Um, and when we inducted her into the England Athletics Hall of Fame, I was genuinely beside myself because it was so exciting. But she was she was a huge influence on my career because she was pulling up sprinting trees in the 80s against the East Germans and winning medals in the 400 metres in particular, of course, in L.A. 84. So she was a massive influence on my career, really making me think that I could do what she did. And as we know, if you can see it, then you can believe it. So there were the major influences at the beginning of my career. And then throughout, as I was saying, along the journey that you go on, you meet people that that have an impression on you and do influence you. And I was very lucky throughout my career from grassroots up to have some amazing coaches. Um, and of course, in, in particular, Mr. Linford Christie, who I met in 1988 when I was 13, and myself and Darren Campbell were running the um, Sprint for Britain Challenge. And he was the face of that. And that's the first time we met. And again, he said such insightful words and encouraging words that it was nice to go full cycle with him throughout my career. And of course, win the Olympic medal under his guidance. So, yeah, always, always lots of people that influence me throughout my career and instilled the belief in myself which sometimes especially through injury I definitely needed so next question can you remember competing in Lübeck Germany as a junior and do you still have the commemorative glass that they gave everyone well what a good question um vaguely not gonna lie vaguely remember the competition in terms of going to a place called that so <laughs> 
that's all I remember, to be honest. I don't remember the commemorative glass. That wouldn't definitely wouldn't have survived to 2022. But what I do remember is, is, is the, the name and the place. So what I can guarantee and I know would be the case if I remembered more would be the fabulous times I had in my junior career because I started internationally for Great Britain at 13. So I had six years as a junior from 13 to 18. And I think that included five major junior championships, three European junior championships, two world junior championships. Um, and it took me until 1993 at 18 to win my first and only individual gold medal in the 200 meters in San Sebastian at the European juniors. So I'm sure that the Lübeck Germany meeting was somewhere along that timeline. But no, I don't remember the glass. Um, God knows where that is, if it's still in one piece. OK, which skills from your competitive track career have you been able to transfer over to your career behind the mic, either as a commentator or an MC? That's a great question because, and I say this a lot when I do a lot of um, speaking events, the, the, the sport and athletics for me give, gave me and taught me totally transferable skills from the sporting and the athletic environment into what I do now and for anybody. Um, I always work on the premise of what do I want to achieve? What is it that I have to achieve in any role that I'm given? And that's whether it's infield, whether it's stadium comms, whether it's TV or radio. And of course, the goal is to give the best performance and the best output that I can. Um, and I find it very, very easy to work through a system of, of, of what do I want to achieve? How am I going to achieve it? Um, who do I need around me to achieve that? So the likes of teamwork, uh, being persistent throughout my career with injuries was a big one, which is the same in, in broadcasting or hosting now and constantly evaluating what I do as well. We used to do that in training, of course, all athletes, anybody watching who runs at any level or competes at any level knows that you, you constantly evaluate what you do to make it better. And you always evaluate when it goes wrong because you don't want it to happen again. But all the skills like that, the goal setting, the teamwork, the persistence, the constant evaluation, I try and make everything I do to the best of, of, best of my ability. And that all helps to lead to a good performance. It, it doesn't matter whether it was 20 years ago on a track or infield or, or commentary and stuff now. So yeah, very transferable skills to anybody from, from sport to any walk of life, whatever you wanna do. Okay, the next one. When you race Kathy Freeman in front of 112,000 people, do you remember it clearly or was it a blur? I remember the 25th of September at eight o'clock in the evening, <laughs> um, as clear as day. Honestly, it's, it's like it was yesterday and not 22 years ago. I can literally close my eyes and see from the viewpoint that I had from lane three in that women's 400 meter Olympic final with, with pure clarity and feel exactly as I did back in 2000. So the whole occasion, in, you know, encapsulated was, of course, it was it was madness. And that could have been a bit of a blur because it came and went. But the actual race itself, um, I remember it like it was yesterday. And from a viewpoint of the, the track and the flash bulbs down the back straight and the, having to concentrate and run the top bend and then the wheels falling off with lactic acid, acid 50 metres to go and thinking, I've got a medal, I've got a medal, have I? And then it flashes up on the board, which seemed to have took ages. I remember all of that from the actual eye level that I raced it at. So, no, I remember it very, very clearly. Um, and it's still something, of course, I'm extremely proud of. And no, nope, it's, uh, it's like it was yesterday, but obviously it wasn't. <laughs> OK, while training as a 400 metre runner, what would be your longest training run or what would be the training block? And what would your average weekly mileage be? OK, I stumbled on that question because the words weekly mileage and longest training run were never really in our compass. Guys, honestly, the longest run we would do and run in a training block would be a three mile run tops. And I'd at least cut off half a mile if I could get away with it, to be honest. And that was in the depths of winter. I never ran over three miles and I'm talking October. November time, the slog work that sprinters hate. You know, Linford and Ron would would drop a long run in, and I'm talking once, twice a week. We never ran further than that, and it wasn't particularly quick. It was horrible. So no, in terms of, of weekly mileage, it was 
probably five, six tops because we work very much on speed endurance. Um, we had a wonderful group who in the quarter miler terms, obviously Darren Campbell was a, was a sprinter, but say myself and Jamie Bolsh and Paul Gray was a four hurdler. We were very much speed endurance athletes with the emphasis on the speed. So we didn't really ever run very far at all. So no, there was, there was no major mileage involved, thank God, because it's not my bag. And I found that out since retiring when I trained for the Great North Run, um, which I started from scratch. I started at a mile six months before and everyone of my friends were like, oh, my God, you know, you want to medal at the Olympics, you'll be fine. No, no, everybody knows it's a different engine. It's a, it's a completely different engine, sprinting and long distance running. So, yeah, it's never been my bag. Um, I'm a bit more into it now when I can be bothered. But no, there was no mileage, really. It's not really mileage, is it, when you're only running three miles tops once, maybe twice a week. We only did that as well for about three or four weeks as well, so it wasn't a major thing. Okay, the next one. The British record in the 400 is currently set at 49.41 by Christina Hurigu. It is. Do you think anyone can break this record anytime soon, or do you think anyone has a realistic chance of getting close to it? And if so, who do you think? Oof. Um, 49.41, British record. Hmm. Can anyone break it anytime soon? The one major talent that is, of course, jumping out the last couple of years is Jodie Williams um, with the progress she's made and getting under 50 seconds now um, is really, really exciting. And again, you see she's coming from that sprinter based background, 22.6, 200 meter runner around that mark and transferring it now into the quarter mile distance. So she is very exciting. I think she has the capability of running faster. Um, and I think she's the one at this moment in time, which is the one that has a realistic chance over the next two to three years, if not before, because she's making great improvements, but has a good realistic chance of getting close to Christine's British record. OK, do you think that Marita Cox's record is untouchable or could someone like Shawnee Miller Weibo beat it? Oof. So we're going from a 49-41 British record, which is great to a 47.6 world record um, set back in 1985. And I think the only way I can answer that is that if you look at the record books for women's 400 meter running, there's only ever two women that have run under 48 seconds. So uh, Cock and Kratos Vilova. 47.6 is insane. 47.6 is mad. Um, I've run in eras with some brilliant athletes. I remember Mary Jo, Jose Perec running 48-25 in Atlanta. She's still six, seven tenths away. Kathy Freeman still six, seven tenths away, and she's around 48-6. Miller Weibo, 48-3. You're still six to seven tenths away. Can I see it going anytime soon? No. Um, do I think Shawnee Miller Weibo is potentially capable? She can get close. She can get close. I can see Shawnee Miller Weibo going under 48 seconds and being the third woman ever to do it. Can she get to 47.6? It's a huge record. It's a huge record. I'd like to see it. I really would like to see it. Now, what do you think that you could have achieved in the 400 if your career hadn't been curtailed by injury? Oh, this is um, a should of, would of, could of type answer, isn't it? In terms of, I should have ran this, I could have ran this, um, and I would have ran that, but I didn't, so it doesn't really matter. But what do I think I could have ran? Uh, I'll caveat it by saying, when I got my medal in Sydney in 2000, that was my first full year of 400 meter running. Um, those of you that know my career will know I moved mid season in 1999 and changed events and went to the Seville World Championships. And I made the final and came fifth and ran 50.2, I think off the top of my head. So. Around 49.72 in Olympic year for my first full year of 400 and then went into 2001 and in my second race ran 49.5, 49.59. We were on track in 2001 knowing that with my coaches I had the ability with them and myself collectively to run fast when it mattered but the Olympics had showed that. September Olympics around 49.7 in the third week in September. So we know that my training was in place to run fast as it was going to be in 2001. 
we were low 49s was the was the plan for 2001 and i can genuinely say that with uh, an honest face and a straight face because uh, 49.5 in my second race we were doing quite well in 2001 and everything was on plan to run at the world championships in edmonton that year and then i got injured but no we were on course and the plan and the training was in place to run low 49s in 2001 but it didn't happen because of injury so it doesn't matter, right? Because you've got to do it. It doesn't matter what you think you could have run. I'd like to have done that, but obviously one's body was not permitting me to do so. Okay. Is athletics a hard sell? What do you make of the health of the sport right now? And what can be done to increase its exposure outside of the Olympic and Paralympic cycle? Okay. Is athletics a hard sell? Is the first part of that question? No. It never has been and it never will be. Athletics is, is the main sport in the world. Don't come with me about football because I'm a big football fan. Track and field is not a hard sell. It never is. Um, even armchair fans every four years will tune in to, to watch track and field. What it has to have is the exposure and the visibility to continue to be seen as, as great as it is. And that means being on mainstream television, that means having as many meetings covered as possible. And that means covering track and field. It means giving an equal balance to every single event that you possibly can. So it's not a hard sell, it just needs to be seen more. And the personalities in the sport need to be promoted more. And we do have the personalities in the sport and we always have done. And we always will do. And in terms of what do I make of the health of the sport right now and what can be done to increase its exposure outside of an Olympic and Paralympic cycle, it's the same thing. It's visibility. You, you, you have to see something to invest your time into it. You have to be brought into a sport to actually care about it and enjoy it. So the health of the sport right now, some will say, could be in a, a way better place. Um, because we constantly seem to be chucking people out the sport or chucking nations out the sport quite rightly. But, and I stand by this, that it is not a hard sell if you can see it, because the sport will quite rightly carry itself with the personalities that we've got. And that is Olympic and Paralympic sport. The progress that's been made in Paralympic sport in the past 10, 12 years is absolutely huge. And I'm always delighted to, to play a part in, in the coverage of that and have worked on three Paralympic Games um, with Channel 4. So, so no, it just needs to be seen. It has to be visually seen. And then, then we're up and running because we've got the people and the characters that can, that can carry it, right? We've got those, got those good personalities. And I think that's my last question. It is indeed. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your questions.